Now, very happy to say we're joined by Irish international P-Man player as well, Anya O'Gorman. She's uh, putting her weight behind a brilliant initiative, really, because um, I guess with the pandemic, it's been tough for people to get out and about and do what they'd usually want to do, not least when it comes to football. So they're launching the 2021 Aviva Soccer Sisters Virtual Skills Hub. So basically what's happened here is that Aviva Ireland and the FAI have launched Aviva Soccer Sisters Virtual Skills Hub. It's as part of the Aviva Safe to Dream Team campaign. So the program is going to roll out specifically designed skills for girls to take part in during the upcoming Easter break. So basically these are free online skills. It's a series will be rolled out daily throughout the week commencing March 29th. And if you want to look at the various videos, then go to aviva.ie forward slash safe to dream team. So aviva.ie forward slash safe to dream team. Onyo Gorman, you're very welcome. How are you doing? Hi, how are you, Joe? Good, yeah, and yourself? Very well. You'd have loved something like that growing up, I suspect. Yeah, definitely. Look, I think it's a, the Aviva Soccer Sisters is a great initiative just to get girls involved in, in football, just to find a love for the game, make new friends, learn new skills. So, yeah, it's a great opportunity and something that wasn't around when I was growing up. I'll bet. Are you involved in this? Can people Are, are people uh, tuning in to see uh, what O'Gorman's got? Yeah, so... Um, I do a couple of skills, yeah, throughout the week. So, uh, yeah, so uh, I'm looking forward to seeing how they, they all unfold and, and everyone's sending in their videos to, to see if you can uh, show me up. Okay, no pressure, no pressure. What's uh, what's your go-to? What's your speciality? <laughs> <laughs> uh, go-to skill, I don't know. Like, there's a really tough one uh, on day two, so you, you can check that one out and see how it goes. I think it's I'm not gonna, I'm not going to let all the secrets out now. No, no, that's fair enough. That's fair enough. I think it's a good thing as well that we're encouraging skill in Irish football because I think as a country down the years we have, you know, honesty of effort and hard work and not to say we haven't produced lots of brilliant, skillful uh, footballers, but maybe it's not always a, a point of emphasis in comparison with other countries. So a bit of skill to go along with the hard work I'm all for. Yeah, I think so. I think obviously we're typically Irish. Yeah. We kind of play in our emotions and a lot of hard work and desire. Um, that that's just been built in us, I suppose, as well. So yeah, it's really good to, to look back on the skills and, and the technical ability and um, try getting girls working on that while, while they're a little bit younger and it'll definitely stand them mm. um, throughout their career. Yeah, for sure. Interesting part of the year for you. So the league gets underway, weekend coming. Nice, easy trip away to Wexford to get things started. Yeah, yeah. So it's a tough start to the season for us. I think i um, be glad to get the first game. First game going, I suppose, pre-season always feels a little bit long and sometimes tough and playing a lot of friendly games and stuff, but we can't beat the competitive games with three points at the end of them. So, yeah, really, really excited and the preparation's been going well for the whole squad. Has it, yeah? So COVID hasn't impacted on prep too much? No, not yet, which would. Like, um, I think we're all pretty good. Um, we are strict protocols in place up in, up in the club as well and we all adhere to them. So uh, we've been fortunate enough so far and hopefully it doesn't uh, play havoc on, on the season going forward. How's the body feeling this stage? Your your veteran status, whether you like it or not, which is a good thing. It's a good thing. Are you still feeling fit? <laughs> <or? laughs> yeah, look, uh, yeah, no, I feel good. Um, I think sometimes maybe uh, when I'm doing it, I'm all right. It might just take me a little bit longer than it used to when I was younger, recovering from what I used to remember when I was 16, playing in the international team and uh, I'd be buffing away, not a bother. I mean, it's like, oh, it's all ahead of you now. So that's the line I give the other guests. Um, yeah, no, it's grand. Tend to, I live down near the sea, so I, I don't put a name that as well. It helps the body recover and, and go again. So, oh, oh, good. Yeah, that, that sea swimming has been a lifeline to a lot of people the past year. Yeah, I think so. I think um, it obviously has a lot of a lot of positives. Around there. To be honest, I only started getting in maybe the, at the end of February, start of March. I'm not that hardcore. Um, yeah, jump in and out and, uh, and off you go. You definitely feel the, the benefits and refresh after it. You mentioned there in the international in the international side at sixteen. It's a bit mad when you think back how long you've been on the go, isn't it? Hundred and plus hundred uh, plus caps. Uh, pretty extraordinary when you when you take a moment to reflect. Yeah, I think so, and I think you only start reflecting, I suppose, when you when you get a little bit older with my veteran status, as you call it. And <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, look, I think when you when you're younger and you're a young kid, you just kind of all take it and destroy, it, don't you? You just it's always on to the next game, next competition. How can I get better? Um, how can I improve? Uh, challenge myself. So yeah, I think it's only when you when you get a little bit older. That's still in me, obviously, to improve and get better and challenge. But but you look back and 
and probably uh, appreciate how young you were at the time when when you look at the young girls coming through and mm. now and appreciate what I suppose your parents did for you and how they supported you get get into football and, and present you with the opportunities. They say never go back. You did step step away from international football and then went back, but I suspect it's not a decision you regret. No, I think at the time um, uh, when I retired, it was uh, I was happy with my decision at the time. Um, and obviously, maybe the break did me good and just, just refreshed and restarted. And when the opportunity came around again, I think I had to grab it with two hands. I regret it probably for the, for the rest of my life. So, yeah, yeah, I'm happy to be back. It feels like I, I never left, to be honest. So, um, yeah, looking forward to The campaign obviously didn't go quite according to plan and we didn't qualify for that, that major tournament. But, look, we're looking forward to regrouping now and preparing for the next campaign. Mm. So over the summer when the Euros are on, are you going to be, well, you might be doing some punditry work, I guess, but part of you will just be, you know, kicking the nearest object as you're watching teams play in that championship. Because, I mean, the way Ireland started the campaign, it, you really looked like in a great position for so long. Yeah, I think so. And I think um, it probably just slipped away. And we can look back and I suppose learn from them games, that, them games that we should have won and maybe the, just the, them pressure games and how we're going to handle them going forward. And that's a massive learning curve. So we're in the situation. Going forward, we can learn to deal and handle with that as well. And I suppose you have to take the positives as well. There's been, been a lot of positives throughout this campaign. And obviously being here in the backroom staff and the management team are staying on. So um, that will give us some continuity and momentum going into the, to the next campaign. Yeah. <laughs> Experience is that weird thing, isn't it? Um, you know, see, I don't doubt it's very important. And you're talking there about what you learn from those pressure games it's kind of probably hard to even explain or verbalize it is verbalize what it is maybe you just have to go through those moments and they do benefit you in in curious ways down the line who knows yeah i think so i think you just have to try and learn i suppose from the, from the hard times and it makes you stronger and, and you get over it and how you overcome come them difficult periods and, and times in your career as well i suppose sometimes it makes you stronger and, and can make you better as well but I think it's important just to reflect on the positives as well and bring them them into the to the next campaign. Mm. So how are P men set up then to defend their title? Obviously things have been very good there of late. You're clearly enjoying your football there. More of the same would be uh, good. What's the um, story with the league at the moment? Is it in a good place? Is it getting stronger? Obviously the electricity have come in as a sponsor now, which looks like a uh, great development. Uh, your sense of where Irish football is domestically at club level for Irish women? Yeah, look, I think obviously this year, like, look, we're 10 years into the season and um, it's obviously great to have the likes of electricity on board, the sharing the sponsorship with the Men's League of Ireland and just to show parity across the board. And I think um, the promotion of the league today has been better. And I think it always comes back to us as players, I suppose, that we need to have a professional mindset and demand uh, the best out of each other. And that when we go out and play, we can deliver on the pitch and put performances in and make it a, a, an entertaining and, and competitive league a league to watch as well. And from a PMI point of view, we, we're under no illusions. This could be the, our toughest season to date, you know, to retain the title again. And everyone's going to be out together. So we have to be at, at the top of the game week in, week out. How's the standard at the moment, Anya? Is it going in the right direction, do you feel? Yeah, definitely. Like, uh, um, obviously, there's an under-17s and 19s um, underage National League now as well. And I suppose that them young players coming through now are coming to fruition and got a lot of young good players in, in the likes of Atlone, even in Wex, we've got a, a lot of young good players as well. So, so that's really positive for the league that um that these clubs are like the I suppose the bottom four teams that finished bottom last year um are improving all the time and they're getting more competitive. I suppose they're being tactically more aware and they're setting up better against the opposition. They're they're definitely more difficult to beat than they have been in the past. So so that's a massive massive plus as well. So look, I think um, the platform's there now to, to drive the league on and, and push forward as well. So I think to, uh, just professionalise everything around the game, set up some clubs, standards, um, and who knows then, hopefully we can go and make the step into semi-professional and then full-time football. Yeah, that's the big conversation at the moment, semi-professionalism as the next step. It's probably hard to predict how close that is. Yeah, I think it's difficult at the moment. You know, I think there's still a, a little bit more groundwork that I'll have to go in, but look, we're definitely in it in a good place and I suppose uh, there's more media getting behind the game as well and they're all welcome pressures with the LOI TV all the games being streamed mm. um, for free and that as well so that gives us good exposure and hopefully then when um, the when the crowds can come back in we'll get more fans into the stadiums and, and we can just build build the game from there but it always comes back to the player that we're, we're at a good standard and that we're making the game competitive and, and a good watch as well. Mm. It's interesting you say tactically things are changing. What kind of changes are you, would we see tactically, say, as opposed to five, ten years ago in the game? 
Like, I just think teams are more tactically aware doing analysis, like all the games are recorded, they go up and huddle, and um, they'll be reviewed. Like, um, so everyone's a bit bit more tuned in and how the team set up their systems of play. And um, the teams all have good coaches and, and good managers in there as well. So, so that definitely helps and, and push the game forward that um, the young players coming through can grow and develop. Yeah. So um, I, I guess uh, in terms of life away from uh, P Mount, so you guys have to earn a living as well. I, I, was I reading your fitness trainer? Yeah, yeah. So, so are you doing? Uh, is, is, has Zoom become your life, or you, can you do the odd small class outdoor? Or what's it been like? Yeah, Zoom now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like us all. Like us all. Yeah. Um, no, yeah. So I'm on Zoom at the moment. So um, look, it is what it is at the moment. I suppose mm. it's unfortunate that I can still take some of my clients online on, on Zoom and stuff like that. But uh, like everyone, it's fine hard, it's difficult to, to get out and about. But I suppose the good weather is kind of helping us now just to get out and move and get some fresh air. Like And, and the benefits for our physical and mental health are, are so, so important. And I know people are getting fed up, but look, hopefully there is uh, some light coming at the end of the tunnel. So yeah, it's been, been a difficult period for everyone, I suppose. Um, and I'm fortunate that we were allowed to go back, go back playing football. So mm-hmm. really appreciate that. We had uh, Professor Niall Moyna on uh, a couple of weeks ago and he was just doing um, a piece on, you know, the various things you should be able to do at a certain age, like how many press-ups you should be able to do yeah. if you're male or female at a certain age or, you know, squats off a chair without using your hands, all that stuff. And honestly, the response we got was insane. And and just the overwhelming response from people was, oh my God, I'm so unfit. You know, it was like a, a wake-up call for a lot of people. So... Uh, what what type of people are you seeing uh, coming to you then? I guess you've got all sorts of people who probably haven't done anything for years and, and want to try and get going again. Yeah, so like I'd have a quite a range. Like you have some young sports people coming in, um, some runners coming back from injury, uh, strength and conditioning runners, some just key fitters, mm. um, some older clients as well just need to move and, and stay active as well. So I, I actually enjoy the, the quite the range as well, the range of as well because obviously quite interested in, in strength and conditioning, but I know the benefits that exercise can have can have for everyone and, and myself as well. I suppose even during the lockdown, everyone's a little bit more sedentary because you're not going out and about. Even the little things you wouldn't notice before. Um, yeah. I suppose if you look at your steps on your uh, on your watch uh, Fitbit, daily yeah. as well, you can just, yeah, on your Fitbit that you can notice that maybe you just don't move. So it's just being subconscious, I suppose, to get out and get moving. Yeah. So are you full on in these classes? Like, could you be doing four or five classes a day, hopping around Joe Wick style, and then have to go training with Piment? Um. Yeah. No. So uh, I have to get. You know, I'm a veteran now. Yeah. You have to get a bit clever. You know, you can just coach. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's the benefit of, of experience. You know. Yeah. Now, to be fair, like during the last lockdown, with the Piment team, we did quite a lot of Zoom. They they all hate burpees now because of me. But uh, yeah, I used to love that bouncing around. Um, yeah, so I will join in the, the odd session here and there, and uh, yeah, keep myself keep myself moving too is is important. Yeah, yeah. How much longer will you? I'm, and by the way, I feel I've offended you with the veteran. You're a veteran, as in you've a hundred plus caps for Ireland. That's just <laughs> in elite elite company. I'm certainly not trying to retire you anytime yet. <laughs> you, you probably still you've got five, six, seven, eight, nine years left easily, do you? Oh, five, six, uh, geez, that one might be optimistic. I don't know. Look, I'm just taking it year by year. At the moment, campaign by campaign, and uh, we'll, we'll see how we go. Hopefully, we'll get the Women's National League we'll back this year. A bit of unfinished business to do in Europe as well this summer, and then we'll go qualify to look forward to. So uh, we'll just see how it goes, I suppose. Mm. Yeah, it would be a lovely thing for you, I suspect, to get to a World Cup. I mean, if that, you know, as a sort of finale to your career, that must be just such a huge ambition because... I was listening. I was uh, when watching the end of the campaign. Or to you, were doing their punditry, and Stephanie Roach uh, was on, mm. and she, you know, they were accentuating the positives, which is all good and proper. But Stephanie was sort of saying as well, yeah, I've sort of been saying that for about ten years. I'm a bit sick of saying, oh, we can take positives. Like, can we just get to one of these things soon? Yeah, yeah, the hard luck story, I suppose. Uh, yeah, like, look, I think that's a dream when you put on the Irish jersey that you want to go play in European Championship or World World Cup, and. Um, and that's the next step, I think, that will really drive women's football to the, to the yeah. next level in the country as well. And um, everything else, the environment now is there for, for that to happen. That I think the players are there. There's a really good mix of youth and experience as well. So, yeah, hopefully it's uh, no more hard luck stories and then it, it's on to the next level. Like the closest we've came is uh, 2008 when we played in a playoff against Iceland for the Euros. Um, and we obviously uh, never qualified in the end, but um, that's the closest. So, 
yeah, hopefully, look, it's, the, the time has come now, I think, to, to take, it, take it to the next step. Yeah, I think the, the, the country's waiting for that big bandwagon moment, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And hopefully we'll get all the best supporters in the world behind us in Ireland. It'll be good. It'll be good. So um, listen, if anyone wants to check out, this is a brilliant initiative, really. So this is running across the Easter break. Aviva Ireland at the FAI, they've launched the Aviva Soccer Sisters Virtual Skills Hub. And basically, it's for uh, skills for girls to take part in during the Easter break. So it's free. It's online. It starts from March 29th. Aviva.ie forward slash safe to dream team is the address. And Anya O'Gorman apparently is going to do some unbelievable skills on day two is what yeah, we're I don't know so. about that now, but we'll give it a <laughs> And can I just add there as well, this year for the first time, Football for All, um, the FAI Football for All programme got involved. So um, the skills are adapted for anyone that has additional needs as well. So it's all inclusive, so everyone can get involved. Brilliant. Great. Listen, that yeah. sounds like an absolutely great initiative. Uh, Anya, we'll let you go. I know you're busy. Lots going on. Yeah. Best of luck at the weekend and yeah. for the season ahead. And we'll talk to you, I'm sure, when international football rolls out again. Anya Gorman, thanks so much. Football on Off The Ball With Paddy Power Fake crowd noise The Emirates never sounded so good Gamble responsibly Gamblingcare.ie Now you're welcome along to the football show So later on we're going to talk to Anya O'Gorman Irish international, if you're uh, listening on the radio and wondering uh, about Ireland-Serbia talk, then podcast listeners will know. We had Dan McDonnell on earlier on, so you can catch that up. In the meantime, with us now, Pat Nevin, evening. Good evening. How are you doing? Are very you well? well. Very well. Lots to talk about. Very intriguingly, before I get to all of that, you said to JP just before coming on air, you've seen the perfect referee or something to that effect? Yeah. Do you know, like, hate talking about VAR, as we all do, um, but being a supporter of it, I had supported it purely because I watched the, you know, the NFL, the referees there. You know, they, they give the, the, the ideas, they give the judgment, they let everybody know, and it's very, very clear. And nobody argues with them. And I thought that's what you should do in football, right? And it's kind of not worked that way. But I don't know if you watched it, and I'm, I suppose many people in Ireland did, but the... The, the France v Wales game, the uh, rugby game at the weekend there. Mm -hmm. And uh, Luke Pierce, I think it was, was uh, the referee there. And honestly, I sat there with my chin on the floor thinking, he's making that look really easy. And by the way, rugby rules are more complicated than football. <laughs> and they're more subjective than football. And you know what? You go on with it. The explanation. And you know, if he's got it wrong, you've explained why he's got it wrong. And I think it was Wayne Barnes who was, who was talking to as well. Mm. I sat there, honestly thinking, can it be that difficult <laughs> to do football in a very, very similar way to that? And it, and, did it, and the amount of people tell me, oh, it stops the flow of the game, there's no excitement. Tell me that with the flow of that game. It was absolutely extraordinary. Yes, it had to stop, but it's still an incredible game. Lots of people tell me now my limited knowledge of all rugby rules. I you mean, know, and people argue all night long whether he got everything right between the two of them. But the way they cl clarified it, I was sitting talking to my wife during it, who probably knows more rugby than I do. But she said to me, That's just genius. Mm. <laughs> We're talking about a brilliant game of rugby going on, and both of us are going, Wow, what a referee! Mm. <laughs> um, so could someone explain to me why football can't just get that idea and move it on to football from rugby? It's, it's a, genius. It's a very it's interesting absolutely. question. Yeah, I was watching. So I'll park the Josh Adams try for a second because I thought he was uh, bizarrely sure that Adams had grounded the ball, even though Wayne oh, Barnes with the, arm, with the hand underneath, yeah. Gritted teeth was trying to say, well, look, if you're, if you're asking me for conclusive proof he didn't, I can't give you that. So if you're right. saying he definitely grounded it, go for it. Kind of gritted teeth style. But, but, uh, but, yeah, but, but the but, argument was clear. The yes. point was clear. Yes, it was you clear. Know, the, re the red card, I thought, was a 
the red car light that was a perfect illustration of how uh, you know they they step by step with brilliant communication uh, walked towards the absolute correct decision i mean initially it was a it was a try and then barnes alerted them to this moment and then it was like well actually that could be a yellow card even and then they talked some more and looked at it again and I mean, by the end of their, what was it, two, three, four minutes maybe, they had reached the conclusion, actually, this was a red card. I mean, I guess the two things jump to mind where they, there's such a massive difference with football and that is, uh, well, one, I'm, primarily, we can hear what Barnes is saying. You know, in football, we are locked out of this conversation. We have a referee with his hand on his ear. And, and that being my point, eventually we need to get there. Mm. The NFL, that, they, they put their hand on a button. And they tell the crowd, they tell everyone. Mm. Everybody knows it, and everybody understands it, and you get it. Um, and many people will say, oh, well, football fans will never you know, learn how to do that or cope with that. Yeah, they will, because people do. They mm. learn to change. Mm. Um, and it was, it was, I thought it was brilliant. I mean, it, I, mean yeah, I, I quite like logic like that, you know, and I think one of them's a barrister anyway, which kind of helps. Wayne Barnes, yeah. Kinda, Exactly. So the logical prog uh, progression of the arguments, I thought they were absolutely they were. genius. So I, I, well done to them. To, to watch a game of any sport and at the end of it thinking, and a brilliant game, yes. an absolute brilliant game, yes, and be thinking, damn, that referee is good. <laughs> yes. This is such an unusual thing. Like there has been, and this is the second point I was going to throw to you, so it's, it's quite interesting. I'm not sure what the uh, law is that, you know, when people are watching, it changes our behaviour. So, you know, you and I are, are talking in a certain way now and because we know people are watching, we're uh, changing our behaviour in, in a way. So an interesting phenomenon in rugby has been that, and Wayne Barnes is one of the exceptions to the rule. Wayne Barnes, I, I, so I'm sorry, I know there's a football audience primarily here, but it's an interesting point anyway, I think. Uh, Wayne Barnes is one of the top referees in rugby anyway. He's very, very, very confident. And by all accounts, even within the refereeing position, he is an encyclopedia when it comes to the rules. So he is a confident... TMO to say the least because he's often the referee uh, there has been a phenomenon interestingly Pat in that the TMOs and, and, and the feeling is because it's so public because everyone is eavesdropping the TMOs are uh, reluctant to counter the referees they don't want to embarrass the referees in some way they don't want to say oh geez, you've got that completely wrong or, I, or they don't want to get into a I totally disagree with you I have to disagree with you you've got that really wrong he put you know in, say in this instance he put his hand on his on his eyes now Barnes did it uh, beautifully but we have seen some instances where because it's so public, the TMOs have kind of been uh, clenching their fists and grinding their teeth and, and not quite saying what they really think. And I presume that's one of the reasons it has remained private, those discussions, private in football. So that's, that's something to bear in mind. We, we, what we saw on Saturday in Paris were probably two of the best proponents of that technology, but there is a downside to going public. Well, and, and I know lots of the downsides as well because... They were every line would be forensically t picked apart. Mm. I mean, I, I noticed that, that a lot of that was picked apart, but particularly by the Welsh afterwards in the Welsh newspapers and online. I noticed that I actually went and looked to see what the reaction would be, which was hilarious because I think Pierce is actually born in Wales, so he's not going to cheat against them anyway. Um, but it was the weirdest thing. I thought, well, actually, because you explained everything so clearly, and if it's wrong, at least you know the reasons why. Mm. So you might argue it's wrong. But you've already got the argument now. Yeah. But, you know, I understand mm. not everyone's going to be as good. Uh, and that's why I put the point across. I think I've seen the perfect referee. Yeah. <laughs> for, and, and you stick them in any situation, I think they could control it as well. But it was uh, it was kind of joy to watch and it kind of... And the other thing, just one last point on that, mm. talk about knowing the rules. The referees in, in football generally have brilliant knowledge of the rules. They really have brilliant knowledge of the rules. Problem is, the rules change every 20 minutes <laughs> and, and they mm. throw the subjectivity in mm. and that's when Kane and knackers it slightly. But, uh, I, I mean, I loved it. I mean, the whole thing was great. Um, and considering it was just a build-up to what was a great weekend of football, it was, a, it was a pretty good start. Yeah. And your initial point absolutely stands as well. I think you did say it. It is, look, perverse and everything to say it, but it is wonderful theatre. I mean, you're watching this high-stakes conversation. Yeah. I mean, don't tell me that's dull. No, no, it was. It was fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, even certain wording and things like that. So one of the French players said, are you sure that's a sending off? And he just looked around witheringly, but, but politely. Yes. Mm. Just carried on. <laughs> no anger, no nothing. Yeah. Yes. I wonder, will football go there, do you think? Will we be able to hear the uh, the VAR conversation? 
I'd like to try it. I'd like to try it. Mm. You know, try it with some of the best ones just for a while, just to see if it works. So there's things that work in football work well when they're trialed, not when they're thrown in halfway through a season and everyone has to react. They don't work well like that. They work well when you trial them for periods of time. And there's many things over the years we forget about it. But lots of things have been trialed. You know, and, you know, pass back rule. Go back all the way to that. That changed. They trialed it first. You trial these things, see how they work, and then you move on. Yeah. Might start with the FA Cup, then semi-final lineups confirmed. Leicester against Southampton and Man City against Chelsea. Leicester's 3-1 hammering of Manchester United generating the most headlines. It was one all at the break, but United were lucky to be uh, one all, And then Leicester uh, kicked on. And much confusion, I think, amongst Manchester United fans that Ole Gunnar Solskjaer made a point of resting some of his top players ahead of the international break. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that, uh, surprising to everyone, really, because if you're looking at it just now, surely he must be fairly confident he's going to get top four. I mean, that's what it's all about with them, top four. You know, they need to get that. And they've, they've got a, a decent enough cushion. It's not a total cushion, but you think he should have been going for that because silverware would be phenomenal for them uh, at any point. FA Cup would be amazing for them. And they, they, they need that. They're like, you know, the top clubs, the Liverpools, the Chelsea, the Arsenal, they expect to get silverware fairly frequently. To, I'm not saying he threw it away. He didn't throw it away, but that wasn't his first team. Now, if you're Manchester City, you can do it because you have got other things. You, you can't take too many chances. And by the way, they threw on a whole bunch of players late on to try and, to make sure they, they got the game won. But I, I would agree with you. It was uh, it was a slight surprise. Um, and I, I think he got it wrong. Having said that, it's Leicester City. It was away from home. And Leicester are pretty good at the moment. You know, the first team first-team players of the first 11 might not have won it anyway. Um, but it was, I, I thought it was a big surprise. I, I think it was a mistake because, you know, trophies are expected. They ain't going to win the league, you know. So that was your, your chance there. And I, I think they blew the chance. And I, I have to say, I struggled to see the logic in that one. Mm, that's twice now it's really backfired on Solskjaer, uh, resting players, that is. He rested a bunch against Sheffield United when they had Arsenal away the following Sunday. And they lost, and that really halted their momentum back when they were top of the table in January, and now it's happened here again. He cited the Milan game and said they were tired, and so he figured it was the right thing to do, but... We always think it on a game-to-game basis, and they're thinking it in blocks of games. Mm. And they are playing a game, all, almost all the teams are playing a game every three and a half days. It's averaging out at that at the moment. And they're, a lot of them are high-intensity games, and a lot of them are a wee bit tighter together than they're used to. And yes, I was at Manchester United when they played against uh, Crystal Palace and it was the worst game I've seen this season. Mm. And the players were completely out of it. And I would have rested three or four of them, including Rashford, including Bruno Fernandes as well, after that game because they were wiped out. So there's a bit of you. He's seeing us in training. He's getting the medical reports as well. You know, On the face of it, it looked like an, an error, but he will have a bit more information than most of us would have. And in this season of all seasons, um, you know, and it's they had to do the Milan, they had to go for the Milan game, um, and something's going to fall. It, it's, eventually, they'll all make mistakes. I mean, most of the coaches just now are trying to do as, you know, as well as they possibly can to keep the players A fit, B, you know, certainly sharp. And it's just it's impossible for most of them. The vast majority, it's just impossible. I mean, we'll watch Liverpool fall. And I've watched in Manchester United having dips as well, but I suppose they're near the top of the league, or as high as they could possibly be behind Manchester City. So it's not that bad, really. Mm. But I have to say, if I was a United fan, I'd be a bit miffed because, you know, which would you have wanted, really? I think the FA Cup was a real possibility. Oh, they're definitely miffed. They are definitely miffed. Uh, Leicester, by the way, without James Madison, without Harvey Barnes, without James Justin... Like they whooped United, it was it was a you know thoroughly convincing, dominating performance on Leicester's part. They were just by far the better team. Um, and you, you wonder like what Brendan's done because he had a, a real period there. Even you talk about those guys that are injured just now, but he had a period before that where he had a lot of players injured as well. And you know he still seemed to have managed it. He still keep, he managed to keep on going. And they have, remember they had a their period in the Europa League wasn't it that they, they went to as well so they've, they've been stressed this season as well so that's not you know the excuse that they don't have the European games they've had that as well so and Brendan's done an amazing job it does help when certain players turn up on the day 
and just go through a, a, a better form that's a bit spectacular. And they are having that just now. They are having goal scoring is coming um, from places they possibly didn't expect. And uh, players that maybe you're thinking, are they good enough really? Um, they've all stepped up and they look fantastic just now. So once again, the way they are playing just now, you wouldn't be surprised mm. if they kept up. On going up to the end of the season, they were one of the ones that were the top three. But and uh, of course they've got the draw that they absolutely yeah. wanted. I don't think there's any argument about that. Everyone, wherever you go, whatever the cup tournament, I think everyone's thinking the same thing. And I know Carlo Ancelotti feels that. <laughs> nobody wants City. Absolutely nobody wants City. Uh, and I was covering the game you know, the other week there against Munchen Gladbach. And uh, yeah, it was, it was extra special. It was really, really special. Mm. And it, it doesn't seem to make that much of a difference, you know, if they make four or five changes either. It still seems that extra special. Now, Xabi Alonso's uh, Munchen Gladbach. Interesting, if you didn't hear that news, he's, he's taken over there. On um, United, Van der Beek got a rare start and his dummy for the Greenwood goal was a rare good moment because otherwise he was pretty anonymous. This isn't working out maybe it's harsh to expect too much from somebody who doesn't have a flow of games and you know probably isn't fully match sharp as they would like to be but it's his lot that he has to take these opportunities it's not working out here at all it's not he is still quite young um the other thing about him is what would his favorite position be well it's standing exactly where Bruno fernandez is standing i would suspect that mm. would be his most favorite position the other thing is i think he's a player that you know, everything, a lot of stuff will go through him when he's, you know, on form and he's the main man in the team. It's an amazing amount of, of one of the main men. It certainly was the case beforehand. And I think it's a bit like that with certain players. You go to our club and uh, remember the same thing happened with Zaha at United. You know, a wonderful, fabulous, great player, but you need to be the main man. You know, if you're not the main man and you're a perif- peripheral and you're only getting little bits here and there, you won't look as good. Mm. And Van de Beek, it's, he does seem as if he's going to be peripheral, whatever he does, because obviously Fernandez has had such a brilliant time in that period that he's been there. Uh, th- th- that's a tough gig for him. I feel sorry for him. But again, with a lot of players that have you know, come, and it does take a year, we, we do want to make decisions on them very early. But just some, it takes a year. It takes a season to... We know all this, we know this story back to front. It's getting used to... You, the, the players you're playing against, the style of the football, the new management, the new place to live, I've, all that stuff stuck together. And of course, you're throwing in you know, a pandemic on top of that. For some people, it's a piece of cake. They just cruise through it and don't think. Um, but for some people, it's tough. He certainly deserves, you know, to the start of next season, have a very good look at him. Because he might, you know, there's a couple of people recently, we've talked about John Stones, suddenly flourish. Mm. You know, uh, uh, Christensen down at Chelsea sudden flourish and you kind of didn't see it to that level uh, and it absolutely can happen and there's a few and there's quite a few obvious ones around that you, you kind of expect it to happen with them as well um and you just don't know but the debate he may well be one mm. of them I'm, I'm not 100 percent sure the dummy was great i did notice that um a number of the press comments were of the great play from Pogba on the left and i'm thinking that was a rubbish cross. <laughs> just a great dummy. <laughs> yeah. I think it would just relieve Pogba made a run. You know, he should be doing that non-stop the whole time. He won lots of plaudits for his performance in Milan and then against Leicester, it just wasn't there. Yeah, but it was, it was actually, Milan one was interesting because you just looked at me and thought, you look at home here. Mm. You, we're bestriding the pitch. You know, he's doing that that movement where he looks sort of bigger than everybody else. Mm. And it's, it's the thing with going on about forever and ever about Paul Pogba. You know, he doesn't get a game for Man United all the time. There is a reason for that, because he doesn't do that all the time. And it's, you know, I, I keep on doing that thing. I told you a number, I mentioned to everyone a while back, just watch what he does after he plays his pass. Always watch him. You know, does he move? And if he moves after his pass, then he's having his day. He's having one of his good days. If he passes it and watches it or jogs with that kind of lazy jog, waste of time. Mm. Absolutely. You, you, you might as well go and some, get somebody like McTominay who'll go and do some work for you. Uh, Solskjaer agree with you after about 64 minutes because he made that substitution. Pogba off, Tellez off, Matic off, Van de Beek off. He brought on Fernandez, Shaw, Cavani, McTominay, but the game was largely gone at that stage. So uh, that's United out of the FA Cup and he's left with the Europa League. As for Spurs, Pat, they are out of the Europa League. 
uh, still reeling if you listen to the various interviews even after their win against Aston Villa. They were 2-0 winners against Villa. Vinicius and uh, Harry Kane with the goals. Interestingly, uh, David Ornstein, who covers Spurs for the Athletic and obviously has good contacts there, has uh, made some news. He said, I speak to a lot of people in football. The consensus is now that Harry Kane would like to leave Tottenham. He can't say that publicly. He's the captain. He's very committed while he's at the club, but he wants to go and win trophies. Now, unfortunately mm -hmm. for Kane, he signed a six-year deal, which takes him through to 2024, and it seems Daniel Levy would want £120 million minimum and no better man to stick to what he wants as a minimum. But this is an interesting development. Now that it's out in the ether that Harry Kane, Mr Spurs, actually uh, wants to leave, and I suspect David Ornstein is right. Kane will not say it. And he, he's not the type of player who'll down tools. He's not going to make this very, very ugly. But this isn't good. This really isn't good. No, it's not good for Spurs. But the other side of it is they have had him for a long time and he has done a brilliant job. In reality, Spurs fans won't complain. Well, they'll complain about it. They'll be upset about it. But they'll absolutely understand it. You only get one career. I mean, he's, is he 28 now? Mm. I mean, he is at that age. This is it. This is the last chance of making the big move where... You know, you can have three or four years at a, a, a really top club. And, you know, I'd, is there anyone who wouldn't take him? I think everyone would. Um, For 120 can, million plus? Is who can afford them? That's really a question. Maybe Bayern Munich won't because, they, you know, they're happy where they are in the direction they're going. But would the Spanish giants take him? They would if they could afford him. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if PSG, if they could afford him, they would take him too, they, which they probably can. The more annoying ones for Spurs fans... Yeah, Chelsea would take him, but I don't think he would go. Man United would take him in a heartbeat, and it would be wonderful for them. Liverpool, similar, phenomenal. But if if Man City don't get Haaland, Harry, Harry would be amazing for Manchester City because of the intelligence of his play. So you look around, who can afford them? Well, yeah, maybe a few people can afford them. Maybe if anyone, whoever can afford them, wants them, I would guess. Mm. And that's 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 the problem that Spurs have got, and the happy situation that Harry Kane's got. Um, and it's I mean for a long time you you always want people to stay and you know, the club they love and all that sort of thing. But it's only one career, and I think when you've done four, five, six years at a club, you've 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 done your bit. Mm. You know he's, he's delivered time and time and time and time again. And if he made it clear that he he was he wanted to go and someone came up with that money, I'd. I, I think it'd be very, very harsh for anyone to have a dig at him. I just don't think many people would. Where it would leave Spurs if he left would be pretty grim, to be honest. On, uh, well, they the thought that'd be bail, didn't they? They thought that'd be bail. Mm. This feels you different, know, though, doesn't it? It does now, but remember, bail was so important. It was so stunningly important to Spurs. And to be fair, they didn't. The money they spent, the bail money wasn't spent that wisely mm. originally, and there was a lot of waste that was wasted. So the situation is, if Harry does go, they really need to work hard on what to do with that money. The problem is, if someone gives you 120 million quid, suddenly that player that was 20, 25 is yeah. now 40. And that's just the way of the world. That's just the way it is. Um, but they'll, that's the big thing. If he does go, it's the imperative that they can use at least some of that money really wisely. And they should be, they should be looking at that right now in case mm. it happens. On the Kane penalty... Gary Kane called, or Gary uh, Neville, excuse me, I'm talking about Harry Kane, obviously called it uh, cute and wily. Now, other people have called it lots of other things. If, if people didn't see this, it was um, Kane effectively, he was on the end line and he didn't play the ball. I mean, he let it run out of play. If Matty Cash had managed to pull out in time or not dive in at all, I guess Kane was pretty certain he was going to dive in to some extent or other, then it would have looked like a, a bizarre ploy to just let the ball go out of play. Now, did this rankle with you? Was this uh, crossing the line into cynicism and beyond, or was it perfectly good, clever, smart play? Um, do you know what? I get too wrapped up in the, in the defender being daft. <laughs> what are you doing that for? Mm. Why are you diving in like that? He's not getting there. Just stay on your feet. The old phrase, stay on your feet, there's money in the game. <laughs> there's no point whatsoever to do that. And I was so involved in saying, why do you do that in that situation? I mean, first of all, I thought he was off the pitch when the actual contact happened, which made me my brain get confused. I'm thinking, actually, he's off the pitch. Is that a penalty or not? Because he's off the pitch. And it probably would have been, but 
that was going to confuse me, but I think it was actually just on the line when the, some of the contact actually happened. Um, I don't think that was a ridiculous dive. I don't. Okay. Uh, and I think, I, the, you know me, I'm, I'm hard on the divers out there. I don't think that was one of the bad ones. I've, I've seen plenty of other ones um, that have been a million times worse than that. I had uh, noted in a couple of recent conversations with different journalists on with us or with yourself that Jose had seemed to be uh, less critical of the players during their slump there, as opposed to previous years when things weren't going well for Mourinho. That's starting to turn now. He's starting to get a bit miffed at the situation. Hugo Lloris, after their uh, defeat on Thursday, did like a seven, eight minute interview on BT Sport, which was really worrying if you're a Spurs fan because he talked about too many players talking the talk, not walking the walk. Something slightly rotten in the dressing room was the overall impression you were left with and players not pulling their weight day in, day out of training and so on. And then Mourinho picked up on that theme even last night after the win against Villa. He talked about the selfishness which is around and he used the word selfishness. He said individual interests are around, the agents are around, the connections between the agents and the press are around. So he said to build a strong collective and a strong dressing room. Nowadays you need time because uh, society and the uh, psychological profile of younger players is not an easy one. In effect, he was kind of saying, yeah, not everything is great in here. And he said Thursday's scar will not heal for a long time. They still only are three points behind Chelsea who are in fourth. Like there's still so much to play for here with Spurs, but the various um, signpostings from the likes of Mourinho and Lloris suggest they're kicking quite hard beneath the water. I'm really intrigued. I mean, we, we can't know for sure. But who's he aiming that towards? You know, that comment about, you know, agents. That, I mean, the, the, you immediately think, is it Deli Alley? I mean, he plays in that game, you know, and, you know, the player he has been in the past and he has been so, so peripheral. I mean, as in distant from the team. Um, but it, it's not just one, you know, it's more than that. Now, I don't know if it's Deli Alley. I have no idea. Mm. But, you know, I, you know, as you say, he's young players and, you know, he's been sidelined a few times as well but he surely can't be one person he's, he's aiming that at so he must be disappointed at a number of them not putting it in and Mourinho of the past his personality was big enough and strong enough and because classically he used to win all the time and when all his teams are winning if Spurs were winning all the time you won't hear any of this none of it at all it just won't happen whereas as soon as you get any problems that's when this sort of stuff leaks out a little bit uh, I'm in Intrigued by that, but that's it's not absolutely new from Mourinho. He's, he's goes through those those periods, and everyone will turn it on him, saying he's either too soft on them or sometimes he's too hard on them. None of it really matters. All he's doing is trying to manipulate situations so he can get the best out of people, and he will try every single different type of situation. I've watched him do every single one of them. You know, the, everyone says you know the, the arm round, the kick up the backside, the two different. Well, there's about forty different ones with Mourinho, and he'll try them all. Um, and it does sometimes look at his wits end. I think he just knows there's a there's a right good attacking force that he's got. You know, when Son's fit, you know, he's got Kane there. I mean, even the other ones that will come in will look good. But, you know, if he can get Bale there all the time, if he mm. Lamella was not getting sent off and shouldn't, shouldn't be doing so, I think there's enough quality there going forward for his team to just about squeeze into the top four. But it needs everybody as a group, everyone as a team. And that's the thing about Mourinho. When he's at his best, he just gels that group really, really tight. But when it splinters, it just explodes. And the fear you've got if you're a Spurs fan is that if there is tension, it's beginning to leak out. Mm. It doesn't leak out the day it happens. It leaks out a long time after it starts. It takes a long time for these things to leak out. You know, you, you, There is a problem for a while because he'll try to fix it. Mm. Um, and it's kind of saddening, really, because there is enough quality there. And if if they do, if Josie did, did go, which wouldn't be a shock, because he's never quite got the defence the way he wants it, which is the base of what Josie was always best at. If he goes before he gets that sorted out, because he's not had long enough there to get the individuals in, it'd be a wee bit of a shame for Spurs, because they never found out what he could have done for them. Um, so I, I, I would hope that he stays on for at least another season. And just the thought, what if Harry did leave and then he had the money and he was allowed to get what he thought was the right stuff in? That would be intriguing. That would be very interesting indeed. 
it's not the way football usually works. It usually works with if you don't get top four or a trophy, then you get hoofed, and that's the way it is. But I would be very intrigued to, because he's he's kind of a, he's due a kind of real period of time with a team that he can really build, um, and he's we know he's capable of doing it. Well, he was. We we hope we suspect he might still be, but we won't know until he gets that time stroke money. Before you go, you were at the old firm game, a one all draw in attendance. That must have been rather strange. Yeah, it's the, sec- it's the second one I've done. Um, and and the, first, the other one was shocking because Rangers won it so stunningly easily. Um, but it is an, an odd, odd scenario. Uh, walking into the game, you know, you have, it's a drive in, you park inside it, which you usually don't get to do it anyway because it's mobbed. And the place was buzzing outside with photographers, not with anyone else, just photographers looking for Celtic and Rangers fans for trouble. And there was none mm. at all. <laughs> Honestly, I must say about 50 photographers with <laughs> big telephoto lenses look, looking for trouble and there wasn't any to be found anywhere. Uh, but the game is intriguing in its own way. Um, you know that Celtic have got uh, quite a lot to do. But the, the, I'm sure you, you know about it far more than I do, but the big story is that, you know, Roy Keane is the, the favourite at the moment, you know, and he seems very, very positive about it himself. The problem he's got is there's, there is a decent-sized rebuild there. I mean, that team's been built around Scotty Brown for a long time. They've got some very talented players going forward, um, but are they a team that's structured enough and organised enough to take on Stephen Gerrard's Rangers? Well, at the moment, they're a long way behind it, mm. and there's a decent amount of work. Uh, the more I've thought about it over the last while, because I've considered quite a lot of people for this and think, Roy would be able to use his contacts really well, I think. I think the players that he could get in, and it's probably only three or four, if he gets three or four that are good quality, and some of them might even be loan, you know, from England, because he's got the contacts, it may well be, unless, of course, he's fallen out with absolutely everyone by then, but it may well be that he is the right guy to get this um, job. And, I mean, how much fun will it be? Well, a lot of fun. How yeah. what, what were you hearing at the club over the weekend? Does it seem like he's very justified favourite to get this job? It's just whispers. I mean, you're just guessing. I mean, it really is whispers. I mean, they love the, the guy who's there, John Kennedy. Um, and he's, he actually he had a very good te- technical and tactical game. In fact, he beat Stephen Gerrard tactically on the night. Now, Rangers were a bit tired. They played a European game. They had lots of problems during the week with all the racist stuff that was happening, um, which was horrendous for them. Mm. Um, and they did look a little bit jaded. Um, but a couple of tactical things that he did. Now, considering Neil Lennon's last game at Celtic Park against Rangers, he was absolutely outthought in that game completely. Um, whereas John Kennedy comes in and does a really good job. And Stephen Gerrard, which is a very tactical thing about what was happening on the right-hand side of um, the Rangers' defensive area. And there was obviously a weakness. And they flooded it brilliantly and they overrun it brilliantly and they kept on doing it and Stephen Gerrard had to make two changes one just after half time one 15-20 minutes later or else his team would, you would have got hammered and to be honest they were almost were yeah. with the chances that were created but it was really well done that John Kennedy seen where the weakness mm. was knew where the weakness would be and absolutely dived in there so you know he's not done himself any harm at all but when Stephen Gerrard said the other side of the city you just know they're going to try and get a big name. <laughs> you just know what they are. There's mm. nothing sure in this world than that's going to happen. It'd be box office. On the uh, racism point, I was uh, reading, I didn't see much of this, but against, uh, it was a Slavia Prague, and for instance, uh, Glenn Kamara claims he was branded an effing monkey by one of the defenders, um, you know, on the pitch. And I saw Scott Brown, uh, was it just before kickoff, Paddy? He walked into the Rangers' half and put his arm around Kamara and they had a bit of a chat, which sounds like a really classy touch. That's gigantic for an old firm game. I would that have thought so. Yeah, that's why but, extra extra kind of resonance to it. Oh, amazing. And, and, and by the way, being Scott Brown as well. Mm. I mean, the absolute demon in the eyes of the Rangers mm. fans. I mean, he's, this... I mean, to us, part of the fun of Celtic Rangers games for quite a couple, quite a few years now, has been just watching Morelis versus Brown, you know, lump each other, kick each other, elbow, you name it, the whole game through. It's a, it's a lovely little sideshow that's great fun, right? Pure pantomime, but great. Mm. And both of them are the pantomime villains of either team for the opposition. 
And for Scotty to walk over and do that, it was class. You're absolutely right. It was class. It was the right thing to do. It wasn't done for show. Sure. It was nothing got to do with that. And it was uh, it was a real. You don't see that many nice moments in old film games, but it was a, a brilliant moment. And uh, you know, looking at all the players before the game, they all they, they didn't take the knee. They stood just just to make the underline the point of what you know, what they'd actually seen. And also uh, going back, I don't know if you heard, and, and if anyone who hasn't heard this is. It's not funny, but it's very close to being funny. You said what the guy said, he called him effing monkey, right? Mm. And this guy has claimed, now we weren't there and nobody else has heard, obviously, except the, the two people involved. He said, no, no, I called him an effing guy. What? <laughs> what planet do you say that phrase? Mm. I mean, I, honestly, you've got to come up with better than that, mate. That's garbage. Honestly, I, I think... If he had a chance of getting off with it because you yeah. and you would say there was only one person hearing, as soon as he uttered that phrase, I think, throw the book at him. Mm. Absolutely. Throw mm. the book at him. On that note, we will talk to you, Pat. Thanks so much. Look forward to it. Cheers. Season. Pat Nevin there with us every Monday. Anya O'Gorman on the way next. Football on Off the Ball. With Paddy Power. Only the cream of the crop pick up Champions League medals. Jonathan Greening's got one. Gamble responsibly. Gamblingcare.ie